welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast, take two. (laughs) I'm your host, Rachel Abbasi. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. Sometimes I start recording and I'm just like totally fumbling over my words and I don't know what's happening. So that's what you just missed. Um, So there are just a few times that I actually re-record. So here we are on day 28 of the Plank Challenge, and we have two more days after this one. So if you are on the five-minute track, you are at 240 seconds today. And if you're on the three-minute track, you are at 170 seconds today. So good luck. Keep it going. We're almost done. And today I want to talk about waiting until you're ready. And I heard a meditation on the Calm app. You guys know that I love to listen to the Calm app. So I listened to the daily trip before my nap in the afternoon. And I listened to the daily calm before I go to bed. So I was listening um, to the daily calm And it was about, uh, she mentioned waiting until you're ready. So this idea struck me because it's important to me. And I think it has come in lots of different forms and phrases over the years since I got sober. So I wanted to talk a little bit about it and what it means to me. Um, It took on just this whole new meaning, really. Um, The first year of sobriety when I first heard somebody say, do the next right thing. And that really stuck with me um, because I just know that so often I don't do something because I don't want to, you know? Um, And if I just turn that off, which I have since called that turning off my wanter, then it's so much easier to just do the next right thing. And I find myself on the path for improvement or growth or enjoyment, or it's always something positive. If I end up turning off what I want to do, um, which is usually be lazy, sit around, not, you know, go in the opposite direction of what's good for me. Um, And And so if I do the next right thing, I end up doing uh, something that in the long run is better for me. Um, And so this idea of of, uh, doing the next right thing, not waiting until you're ready, continues to be something that I get to push through or push down that barrier when I'm faced with something hard. Um, And I think in the beginning of sobriety, the things that seemed hard to me uh, today seem easy to me. And it's because I did the thing anyway, Um, like getting up on a Saturday morning and going to a sobriety meeting, like that seemed hard to me then. But today it not hard, you know, and I think that what makes it easier is doing it anyway. And then you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad, you know. Uh, So I find it easier to ask myself, what am I waiting for than it used to be to ask myself. Um, If I listen to the answer, if I ask myself, what am I waiting for? And I listen to myself answer that the thing that I'm waiting for, if it's uncertain to happen, then it's time to go. And I have a good example of that. So get up and go. And these days, I don't even wait for myself to answer. You know, I just, as soon as I have that feeling that I'm waiting, or that I'm avoiding, or that I'm uncomfortable, I just go before I even let my mind complete that sentence. So in sobriety, like I said, it was phrased for me as doing the next right thing. And I always give that example of when I was sitting in my recliner, my beloved recliner. I was just talking about this recliner this evening. I was like, 
honey, I need that recliner back. <laughs> He's like, well, you can call it. We sold it to like some lady with, with college students. So she's like, you can call her and get the recliner back. I'm like, no, I don't want that one back. But I want a recliner. I just loved that recliner. It was so, so many naps were done on that recliner. Anyway, I'm going to get myself another recliner. And so I stray from the topic. Anyway, I was sitting in my recliner on a Saturday morning. This is when I lived out in Charlestown. And I had been working all week. I had like an hour and a half commute both ways. So on a Saturday morning, I'm sitting there with my boyfriend, my kids. I'm exhausted, but yet I'm so like feeling so complete that I don't have anything to do for two days. You know, the last thing I wanted to do was get up get dressed, pack my coffee in a to-go cup, and go to an AA meeting, you know? Um, I just wanted to sit there and relax with the rest of my family, but I knew that going to the meeting was the next right thing, and I knew that going to the meeting is going to feel good. You know, it may not feel good walking in, but it always felt good walking out. So instead of sitting there and letting that feeling of dread in my gut get bigger and bigger, I would just get up. And I say often this concept of turning off my wanter, that moment that I don't want to, um, the moment that that forms in my mind, I don't let it finish. I don't let that sentence finish ever anymore. Uh, because it's it's bad. It's it's never good for me if I'm thinking I don't want to. Um, because it's usually, even if it's something like, I don't want to be around people. I want to just take a nap or something like that. You know, of course, there's a fine line of when I actually need to take a nap for my own, you know, health. But a lot of times, I don't want to do it because um, I want to isolate. And that's not good for me either. So when I start thinking I don't want to, it's a red flag to me now. But I've been practicing this for seven years now. Knowing that I don't want to is usually an indication that I should. So I simply just get up and move toward that thing. Um and it's, it's about not giving power to that feeling of I don't want to, that dread, but instead linking that feeling to action, to immediate action. And that's where I don't let myself finish the sentence. Like as soon as that thing starts getting in my gut, I just go. I just take a step. Um, so after months of linking that feeling, years, honestly, let's be real, after years of linking that feeling to action, to moving toward the thing that I don't want to do, um, I feel like it has really become a subconscious habit now. It's similar to linking discomfort to action. Like when um, I've talked about, I think in the past, like when I was asked to present at work um, before this, you know, newfound realization that I need to go towards the thing that I don't want to, I would just start letting that anxiety and dread set in, you know. Um, but now when you know, well, not now, I'm not working now, but towards the end of when I was working, um, when I would feel that feeling of like, oh, I don't want to, or anxiety or something like that, um, now I just enthusiastically would say, yes, I would love to, you know, and I, I, it probably even comes across like that. Yes, I would love to. And I think there were times like my boss would be like, okay, because that's how much I need to um, act as if, I guess, you know, acting as if I'm brave 
makes me brave. There is no difference in my mind between acting as if I'm brave and being brave because the very act of acting as if is brave. You get what I'm saying? It's all related. So for me, waiting until I'm ready, it doesn't exist. The phrase itself is an oxymoron to me. If I wait, the more unready I feel. The more anxiety symptoms are noticeable to me, the more my heart starts racing, the more dread, the more that heart racing sinks down into my gut and that feeling of like losing my appetite and all that stuff. Um, And the more that all of that happens, the more that the symptoms are noticeable to other people outside of me, you know, because I can't even, um, even act excited at that point. So um, I'm the kind of gal now who likes to volunteer first. I'm the nerd that goes first now. And the reason why is because I don't want the anxiety to make me, to incapacitate me. Um, So some of those people who go first that you see at work or in school or whatever, they may not be suck-ups. They may have an anxiety disorder, and it's what helps them um, get through whatever that discomfort is faster and with the least amount of anxiety. So something to keep in mind, it it definitely um, works for me and it never used that. That wasn't who I used to be. I used to just wait. But now I really find that I suffer less if I just go first. If I just prepare, I lean in, you know, I go first and then um, I'm suffering less. So I am embracing the discomfort today, and I'm moving forward, doing the next right thing, even when every fiber in my being is resisting. And it is truly like that for me. I don't know how it is for everybody else, but I will actually start shutting down. Like, I I don't even move my body starts moving differently because that's how heavy the dread starts to just shut me down. And um, so this mindset is working for me in sobriety. And it really has been applicable in every facet of my life. Now that I'm fully present in my life, suiting up and showing up, that's yet another way of saying doing it Uh, whether you want to or not, whether you're ready or not, like it's all the same thing, no matter how you phrase it. And it is sobriety that introduced me to this whole concept of, um, of just doing. And so new challenges, changes, stepping out of my comfort zone. The idea is to act and not to wait. So I almost feel like this is a pep rally episode um, because I challenge you to reflect on this. Like, what are you putting off because you feel like you're not ready? What is the next right thing you could be moving a step towards? You know, big things and little things. What are you sitting here doing now that you know? Like, what are you sitting here and avoiding? Is there something you uh, need to do, like your taxes? <laughs> That's a good example. Um, and you're not doing it because you just don't want to. Uh, I'll do it when I'm ready. You know, there is no such thing. And honestly, <laughs> whatever you're hesitating, let's see if I can articulate this. Whatever you're hesitating on, the longer you spend the time beforehand hesitating on it, the more you're taking away from the backside after you do the thing. You know, we only have a certain amount of time that we're going to live. So why not spend the, the most of that time that you can enjoying it? The longer we sit waiting for something, 
until we're ready, the less we're stealing from the backside of our lives, you know? So just get to it. Um, If I can learn how to use my iPhone and Mac blind, then you can get up and do whatever that thing is. (laughs) Yes, I went there. I was, uh, for me, I was waiting to heal before I dedicated myself to switching over to voiceover 100%. I was waiting to see if I was going to heal. And what I recognized after talking to this um, wonderful woman that I spoke to from the Foundation for Fighting Blindness, um, I found out that I don't need to spend another day like in pain. You know, what am I waiting for? Um, In her case, she's going blind. So her waiting is really inhibiting her from um, being able to fully know the tool, know the accessibility features before she's totally blind. But I was thinking how much that resonates with me not because I'm blind, not because I'm going blind, but because I'm stealing away time from my future self by hesitating right now. And I don't want my enjoyment of life to wait on something that I'm not sure is going to happen. You know, I don't know if I'm going to heal. So what am I waiting for? It's time to get up and live now. It's time to be able to enjoy these things without head pain now. So break the cycle of hesitation and act. I keep discovering that growth lives on the other side of my discomfort always. And the best time to move is now, is before I'm ready. If I wait until I'm ready, it's too late already, you know? And if you've, if you've ever turned off your wanter, you know, if you've been listening to this episode and you're like, yeah, I know what that means. I've, I've been saying it to a lot of people. I say it in meetings and I've had people say, yeah, yeah, I know what that means. Like, just turn it off and just do. And if you have been listening and you've been starting to do that, I want to hear from you. I want to hear how turning off your wanter and just doing the next right thing is helping you, you know, in the smallest ways. I would love to hear your story um, because you sharing your story with me um, might inspire someone else. You know, I can share it on the podcast And I would even love to have you on the podcast. If you want to share it yourself, that would be awesome. But, um, but you don't have to, you can just send me an email and, um, and I'd love to share what it's doing for you. And, um, and maybe we can inspire other people as well. So thank you for tuning in to today's episode and I will talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.